Beverly mentioned my name is David Rosenfeld, and um, my parents are Holocaust survivors, and I'm living now in uh, Mill Valley uh, near San Francisco uh, in California. And what I want to talk about today is, uh, this is just kind of the, the direction I'm going to go. Uh, this is the introductory part, and then I'll just kind of give an overview of, uh, in addition to being invited here, why I'm why I'm actually here and why I'm doing this in the first place. And uh, then I'm going to get into uh, my father's story, talk about my mother's story, and what that all meant to me uh, growing up here in the United States. First generation um, growing up here since uh, my parents are both uh, immigrants. Um, and I appreciate everyone coming. We had no idea how many people would show up, so I'm blown away by, uh, I mean, we set up chairs here earlier this morning, and we've literally doubled the number of chairs that we had set up originally, so. My story and my parents' story is just one of many stories, uh, literally millions of stories of, of people who um, were, uh, experienced World War II and, and all the, the horrors of, of, of the war, including the, the Holocaust. So uh, with that, um, why am I here? Uh, again, not just because of uh, Beverly's invitation. Um, my dad died last November. He was 91, and, um, and, and my mother is still alive. She's 90. She's, uh, I grew up in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, which is where my parents were, uh, where my dad died, and my mom moved to Memphis with my sisters uh, after, after my dad died. And, um, when my dad died, it, it just really got me to thinking, of course, about uh, his story, and I started doing, uh, kind of doing our family tree. I did our family tree like many, many decades ago, actually, and just kind of dropped the project. Had a lot of other things going on in my life, but, uh, but since then, I've been on Ancestry.com a fair amount and put our whole family tree together and have been a little bit more interested in, uh, in, in kind of filling all the holes and figuring out uh, where I came from and who my ancestors were. I found people all around the world who uh, had fled the Holocaust to, uh, to different locations from South Africa to Japan to uh, um, uh, all different places in Europe. And um, also my mom and dad used to speak in front of groups uh, like this uh, to schools, military organizations, churches. Uh, and they didn't actually start speaking about the Holocaust until they were in their 60s, which, is, which I didn't even realize until I started researching for, for, for this talk here, uh, that they didn't start until, uh, I'm 66, and uh, they, so they were around my age when they finally um, actually went out and started talking about their experiences. It was really difficult for them to talk about their experiences when I was young. And um, a lot of things they still didn't remember about what happened uh, in Germany. So even the stories I'm going to tell are, are not totally complete simply because they don't even remember a lot of the things that happened at that point in time, just uh, lost. And then the fact that my dad did die uh, in November just kind of gave me pause too. And, and I've heard this many times, but made me realize that the, the people who actually experienced the Holocaust firsthand uh, are old, <laughs> older than me, and I'm old, um, and, uh, and they're, they're dying, and so um, it's just, pardon? Oh, okay. Uh, and so it's, um, it's important, I think, to carry those story, stories forward, to keep, to, to, to make people understand that the Holocaust was real, it really happened. Um, it's really strange because since the Holocaust, I mean, there's been other genocides. It's not, it hasn't really ended with the Holocaust. Uh, it keeps happening in, you know, Rwanda and uh, Africa and uh, uh, Bosnia. I mean, there are just a, a, a lot of other stories, nothing quite so horrific, I think, as, as, as the Holocaust, but, uh, but we keep doing this. So it's just important to carry the story forward so people, so it doesn't happen again. And, um, and since I retired last year, uh, I've got a little bit more time to be able to do that. So that's why I'm here. 
And uh, just in that vein, you do hear of a lot of times people denying that the Holocaust even happened. I thought it was appropriate. I'm not going to read this. Uh, you can read it from your seats. But uh, I just thought it was interesting that along the way, I realized that Dwight Eisenhower, um, when the war ended, um, deliberately went to a concentration camp just to see for his own eyes, with his own eyes, what, uh, what had happened. And he was totally shocked. And, uh, and wrote about it and, and basically wrote exactly what I just said is that th this was incredibly shocking to him and it's something that we need to teach people about and make them understand that it, that it did happen, it was real, and it should never happen again. So this is my dad. And uh, he's, uh, that's a picture that was ac actually taken about four years ago, I think, when, um, when my niece got married. In, in Tennessee, and um, and actually speaking of Tennessee, someone just mentioned the uh, asked me if I'd seen the, the movie Paper Clips. If anyone has a chance to see the movie Paper Clips, uh, it's it's a story about school children in Tennessee, um, a teacher teaching about the Holocaust, and they were trying to figure out what since six million Jews were killed, uh, murdered, um, a million of half of them were children, by the way. Uh, they were trying to figure out what is six million, how much is six million. So what they did is they started collecting paper clips, and their goal was to click to collect six million paper clips. And uh, they filled a box car with these uh, these paper clips. So um, so it was uh, pretty pretty amazing. They got more than ultimately more than six million. But someone made a a, a documentary film about them. It's a very interesting uh, film if you have a chance to see it. And it was a school in Tennessee, so it was relevant in that respect. So my dad was born in Zeheim, uh, Germany. I thought I'd put a little map up here so you can see uh, relative to, this is a, this is a current map of, of Europe. And uh, Zeheim is just a, uh, about uh, less than an hour drive south of Frankfurt. And uh, I've been there a few times. I'll talk about that later. Uh, but just to uh, help you understand where uh, uh, dad came from. This is uh, the house where he grew up. It's still standing. I've been there a couple times. This is my uh, grandfather and uh, grandmother who uh, both died uh, during the war, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, my, in, in my studying the family tree, I found uh, that my father's, uh, on my mother, my father's mother's side, maternal grandparents settled in Hessen. Hessen is, is like a state, like Oregon. So uh, Frankfurt, Hessen, Germany is like uh, um, Monmouth, Oregon, United States. So uh, Hessen is just the, the, the state within, uh, within Germany. And we can trace uh, uh, descendants back to the Spanish Inquisition. Then they actually moved to Holland and then to uh, Hessen, uh, that area, Zeheim, uh, Frankfurt, where they've been for uh, uh, hundreds of years. And on the paternal side, we've only been able to track a couple generations back. So at some point, it'd be nice to be able to find out how, uh, how he goes back further than that. But that's the most I've been able to find. My grandfather um, was a gross, well, he had a grocery, which evolved into a um, dry goods store, which they ran out of that, that house there that I showed you in, uh, in Zeheim um, as uh, things got worse with, uh, with uh, the Germans and the Nazis, and um, he couldn't, uh, for instance, um, uh, sell. He couldn't even have a store. Uh, the um, uh, his he, he would go around actually selling uh, dry goods. Are are material, by the way, uh, like uh, on a uh, material on a roll. At, at that point, uh, everyone made their own clothes and linens. So uh, my grandfather sold them the materials to allow them to do that. And uh, he um, would go around with my, uh, my great uncle uh, around to different villages selling. Um, and that eventually, uh, that business dried up. No pun intended there. The, uh, the, um, uh, the, their, their good customers would start coming in the, at night in order to buy uh, the goods from my grandfather because they didn't want to be seen uh, at the store during the day. It was just kind of bad karma. 
My grandfather was 47 and the grandmother 32, so there's actually quite an age difference when they married in 1920. My dad was born in 25 and my, uh, my uncle, uh, Uncle Herbie, in 1922. Uh, my Uncle Herbie, by the way, uh, died in 2012 and he was living in Chicago. Uh, my grandmother's uh, brother, my great uncle Max Meyer, lived with them in Zeheim. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Max later, but he was killed during the, uh, uh, by the Nazis as well. So this is my dad. Uh, he's the only one with the hat on. He's just a little guy. I'm, I'm not exactly uh, tall either. As a matter of fact, I'm the tallest one in my family, so, and I'm, I'm only 5'6". So, uh, I think my dad was 5'3 when he finally reached the, the peak of his uh, of height. Uh, this is the public school, uh, the picture of the public school he went to. He didn't go for, uh, to the school for long. Um, uh, he was, uh, I mean, the students and, and the teachers uh, would uh, harass him and, and literally stoned him, not to hurt him, but just throwing stones. They didn't want him to come to the school because called them names. Uh, so he left the school and uh, he went to a Jewish school in Darmstadt uh, associated with the synagogue. There are two synagogues in, in Darmstadt that I understand. Darmstadt's north of Zeheim, about uh, 10, 15 miles. And um, just to kind of put it into context, just in terms of this time, uh, 1933 was when Hitler was appointed chancellor of Germany. You may have heard of the book that he had published a few years earlier, um, Mein Kampf, My Struggles, which he talks about uh, uh, how he became an anti-Semite and how the Jews should be exterminated. So that's kind of the, the, the genesis of the, the Nazi uh, attitude about uh, Jews. My dad, when he went to school, he had to take a train or streetcar, and then he had about a mile walk uh, uh, from there. Um, and then um, Kristallnacht happened. Um, you may have heard about the, that, uh, the Jewish pogrom uh, on November 9th in 1938 when dad was 13. Across all of Germany, uh, people would go in, and it's called the Kristallnacht because they broke the wind, they broke the glass of all the Jewish uh, stores and businesses and, and homes, and that's kind of how it got its name. But uh, they burned synagogues and stores were ransacked, um, including uh, my uh, my grandfather. So the uh, what happened that day. My father always told me these stories, but I thought they were two separate stories. He got to, he was going to a school in synagogue in Darmstadt, and he took the train to school, and it happened to be on November 9th, and um, he got off the train, he still had a mile to walk, but he could see smoke in the distance, and, uh, and people came back from that direction telling him that the, the synagogue was burning, that he needed to go home. And so he took the streetcar home, and when he got home, uh, the way he described it, about uh, a, a dozen thugs um, had gotten out of, uh, got, come to his store and were um, tearing things up in the store, taking everything out of the store and throwing it on the street. And my grandfather, who was sick at the time, um, he died of pernicious anemia a month later, uh, but he was, uh, not well, and he got out of his bed and was yelling at these guys. So, I served Germany in World War I, uh, in the army in World War I. I fought for Germany. This is the thanks I get for that. And um, so, the same day he, he, he comes home from school, his, 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 his uh, house gets uh, broken into and, and, and ransacked. And then, uh, a month and a half later, his, his father died. So it was uh, pretty traumatic. And I didn't, like I said, I, until I put this together, I didn't even realize this was all on the same day. Um, so uh, this is one thing, obviously, my dad remembers. He was 13 at the time. And um, so my grandmother, uh, in order, since he didn't have a school to go to at that point, um, uh, my grandmother sent him to an orphanage in Frankfurt, uh, where he tried to go to school from there. Um, they, they kept closing schools, middle school, uh, et cetera. So he had to, even while he was in the orphanage, he had to kind of move from one school to another. Um, he had a, uh, a number to uh, go to 
a, a, a quota number to, to go to the United States. So they've been trying to go to the United States for a while now. And um, uh, my uncle Herbie came to the US actually in 1938. He came because a cousin who'd gotten to the United States was able to sign an affidavit that, that he would take care of Uncle Herbie if he couldn't make a living in the United States. So that was one way that you could get here. You had to have someone sign a paper that you could uh, support them. And he could only sign for one person uh, at that point. That's why my grandmother and, and, and father were, were still in Germany and hadn't come over yet. Um, but uh, my mother's quota number was around 33,000. The, the, the times, the important thing is to think about what's going on at this particular point in time, not just in Germany, but around the world. The United States uh, had not declared war on uh, Germany at this point. The, attitude in the United States, I hate to say it, but it's very similar to what it is today about immigrants and refugees. Uh, so um, that's one thing, I mean, one reason I'm a little bit passionate about this is that uh, the United States could have saved a lot more people, a lot more Jews who were trying to get out of, uh, out of Germany. And it's very real to me because my great grandmother and my mother, my grandmother are two of the people that had quota numbers to come to the United States who could have been uh, saved but, uh, but perished in the, in the camp. So, uh, but my dad, by being at the orphanage, got an immigration number through the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society, the highest, and it turned out to be a lower number uh, or higher number, however you want to look at it, a number closer to the top. Uh, for him to be able to uh, leave Germany and, and go to the United States. And um, so he uh, was able to utilize that number through Hyas and get on a, a, a boat to, uh, to go to the United States. Uh, he was in Darmstadt, I think, working on, or Stuttgart, getting the, the papers, got on a train. The train actually went uh, from, uh, from Stuttgart to Berlin and then back through Frankfurt. And when he got to Frankfurt, um, for some, somehow my father still doesn't know how that, that my grandmother knew that he was going to be there. She might have just been waiting the whole time on the platform. But um, she was on the plane, train platform when his train came through. And that was. Um, <sighs> That was the last time that my, uh, my father saw my grandmother. Um, he got a, uh, this is a visa he got to, uh, to leave Germany. Um, he um, got on the, uh, this is the, the actual picture of the boat that he, I was able to bring up the, uh, a picture of the boat that he, searching on the internet the boat that he took to uh, the United States. And this is the manifest, which uh, got translated. And again, through some research, uh, it's very interesting what's on here. Um, I'm not, hopefully you can read this in the back. But it talks about, it shows his name, Eric Erich is actually his given name, Erich Israel Rosenfeld. The Germans forced all the Jews uh, to uh, have the middle name Israel. The, the, the guys, the, the, the females, they had to use Sarah as their middle name. So the, uh, this was because the Germans, uh, you know, new law, regulation, whatever, they uh, forced all the, uh, all, the, all the men of Jewish descent to, uh, to take that, that middle name to identify the fact that they were Jewish. Uh, he was 16 years old. Uh, actually, at the it shows that he's a carpenter apprentice. Actually, at the uh, orphanage, he uh, was learning English. He was learning Israel because he they were also, he was also attempting at the same time to go to Israel. He might have gone to Israel. Israel was not a formal formally a state. Israel by the British proclamation was you know the Balfour Declaration was a state at that point. Um, so uh, Israel was taking refugees as well, but. Um, he got the, finally got the opportunity to go to the United States, but he was learning at uh, the orphanage how to be a cabinet maker so that he would have something that he could do when he, when he emigrated, that he had a skill. Um, and um, so he's Hebrew race but, or nationality, but 
Judaism is a religion. It's not a race. It's not a nationality. Uh, but uh, that's the that's the way they were looking at it. It's interesting. He had to have fifty dollars, and um, and then when he got to the United States, it was the German Jewish Children's Aid uh, Society, which actually. Um, picked him up from, from the ship and, and supported him there. He was, he was there actually to see his, um, his brother. So he ended up you know, hooking up with his brother there. But uh, and that was another reason he went to the United States rather than Israel. His mother wanted him to go to uh, the US because his brother was already there. By the way, I'm not sure if I said this at the beginning. This is my first time doing this. So uh, hopefully <laughs> uh, it uh, comes out OK. I'm still trying to remember what I put in the order here. but. Um, the, uh, uh, so the, uh, so this is my beta test for, for this. Is, uh, the, um, so my dad worked for the printing com same printing company my brother worked for when he uh, was in the United States. And then he, uh, when he was eight, turned 18, he went into the Army. And so there's a couple of pictures from, uh, from being in the Army. The little guy in the front, that's my dad. And uh, so interestingly, uh, in, since he was, uh, he spoke German, um, he returned to Germany uh, with the army. And he got to Germany about two months after D-Day. Uh, he was uh, ultimately assigned to military intelligence. When uh, the Americans went into Germany, they actually liberated the town where my dad was born. Uh, where he, uh, so he recognized people and, um, and I want to play a clip, a video clip. It's a couple minutes long, um, but I wanted to give you the, uh, the talks a little bit about this. But the uh, Steven Spielberg started a project uh, called Showa to uh, document the experiences of the Holocaust survivors, and uh, there's been uh, thousands of, of tapes that have been recorded. It's now handled by the University of Southern California. But uh, Steven Spielberg sent a letter to my dad and my mom uh, thanking them for, um, uh, for making this tape. So let me try and play this uh, just a couple minute uh, video. Uh, I left Frankfurt on, the, the ship left Lisbon on August 20th, 1941. What happened to your mother? My mother I left. I left behind, and uh, when I uh, went on a train, I went on a train to uh, Berlin, and then seven others joined me. Went right back to Frankfurt. My mother was on the platform. I don't know how she found out. That's the last time I saw her, and uh, said goodbye, and. Uh, after I came to the States, we tried to get her over through Cuba, but it didn't work out. She was uh, uh, deported in, 19, in March of 1942. And do you know where she wound up being, or where she died, or what well, happened? Well, uh, I uh, was in the Army. I came to the States. I, uh, I was in the American Army, and I went right back where I came from. I took the mayor at the time, Mr. Uric, for a ride and asked him questions. He told me that they uh, asked him to bring all the Jews to Darmstadt. She went to Darmstadt where the Jews from the area were gathered, and they went on a train, I believe, to Auschwitz. And incidentally, the mayor didn't think he was going to come back alive. He, I had a sidearm, I was carrying a sidearm at the time, I was in intelligence. And uh, I had him in my jeep and we drove around and uh, he, uh, he was Catholic, was reading his, reading his rosaries. And uh, it took a while for me to decide what to do about it. It was very difficult. But I decided to take him back to the uh, city hall because I didn't feel they would be right for me to kill somebody in cold blood, which I could have done without any consequences since the war was still on. The war was not over. I would have done it. Nobody would have said a word. Was it an assignment of yours? No, it was not. I did this. Uh, I, I was in uh, intelligence. I could do more or less 
what I felt appropriate under the circumstances. And in, under the intelligence division that you were in, what were your duties? Uh, gather intelligence. So after the war, he uh, moved to Chicago uh, and then Rochester uh, for, for his job. Uh, but then it was, it was when he got to Rochester that he uh, met my mom. Uh, he did go back to Germany one time uh, when I was 12 years old. I still remember that because my, my brother had, actually I, think I was, actually I think I was 14, my brother was, well whatever. My brother's 12 years younger than I am, but he's, he was a little baby and so they hired this babysitter to take care of my brother, but she was just a real bossy babysitter and I hated her. It's like, <laughs> I was so mad at my parents for leaving her with Mrs. Yates. <laughs> but uh, as I mentioned earlier, later in, in their life, in their 60s, mom and dad uh, started talking to schools and churches, et cetera, about their experience. Um, I think one of the interesting things about my dad, uh, his experience uh, being Jewish here in the United States is, he had a bar mitzvah when he was 63. So he, if you think about it, I thought about it, it's like, well, he was 13, which is when you have your bar mitzvah, when all this was happening, Crystal Knock, his dad dying and being sick. And so my dad honestly does not remember whether he had a bar mitzvah or not. Yeah. And uh, so, so he thinks he might have, but he, didn't, he certainly didn't remember it. So, he, um, so when he turned 63, which is, uh, uh, he, he decided to, 50 plus, you know, 13, he decided to have his bar mitzvah. And he had a bar mitzvah at the West End Synagogue in, in Nashville. And then he did it again at 83. And uh, the reason at 83 was because, uh, actually, Kirk Douglas did this. Um, in Jewish uh, tradition, the idea is that you've lived your full life at 70, and then 13 years later, you, you know, you're 13 again, it's your second life, and you get to be bar mitzvah again. So, uh, so he worked as a, a printer, um, and uh, when he uh, got over here for a, a number of years, and the printing industry changed quite a bit, and he eventually worked for uh, the IRS and, uh, and until he retired. And um, just a couple of pictures from uh, uh, this is uh, when we went to Germany. He went over, I think I skipped that bullet point, but we, uh, my brother and one of my sisters and my father went to Germany um, together, uh, which was a, a very emotional experience as well. Uh, very interesting because my dad was speaking German, of course speaks fluent German, and uh, so it's a lot different than when I go over to Germany and I don't know German. He could just get us around everywhere. Uh, but this is uh, visiting uh, his father's grave in, uh, in uh, Alsbach, which is near Zeheim. And interestingly, this was, uh, my grandfather was one of the last people, last Jewish, uh, well, the last people, because it's a Jewish cemetery, to be actually buried in this, in this cemetery in Germany. So it's, it's way at the end. It, it, I don't have a picture here, but there's rows and rows of graves, and this is the only one in the, in the last row of the grave next to the trees here. Uh, for my, uh, my grandfather. And this is um, when we went to Germany, um, that's uh, my sister Vera and my brother Ken. Um, he spoke in front of a middle school in, um, in Zeheim. I don't remember Zeheim or Frankfurt, but somewhere around there he, he spoke to, uh, and he spoke in German, which was great, to, uh, to the middle school there ex talking about his experience. So now he not only had a chance to talk in front of American Americans uh, in, in schools, but he did that uh, in Germany as well, and they were very receptive to, uh, to his story. So that's my father. Let's uh, move on to my, my mother. Um, uh, my wife correct, wanted to correct me and take the, the, the dash out of Eva Ruth, but that's the way I remember she spelled her name, uh, or she spells her name uh, that she, given. Uh, apparently they put a dash in the... Uh, when she was young, but uh, she just still uses Ruth as her middle name. But anyway, Dad didn't have a middle name. Uh, Mom had Eva Ruth. I was never totally sure whether her name was Eva Ruth or her name was Eva and Ruth is a middle name. But anyway, uh, her maiden name is Lapena, so uh, that's the the name she grew up with. And she was born in um, Königsberg, Germany. So. Uh, it's now Kaliningrad, which is actually a part of 
Russia. It's one of their ports on the Baltic. It's the only port they have there. So, um, so this little piece of, of land here is actually Russian. But this is a current map. Um, but Germany at the time actually uh, had this part of, of, uh, of Europe was, was part of Germany. This is Prussia. So Germany actually extended all the way. Uh, there was a little, little piece here that Poland still had. Uh, but then the rest, all of this here was, was part of Germany. So the part, the part of Germany that my, so my mother was born in Germany also, but it's just not Germany now. So it's Russia. So I don't know if that means my mother's Russian or German, but <laughs> she just is. So my uh, mother's father and grandfather were both uh, pharmacists. Uh, my mother was born in 27, and her brother Wolfgang was born uh, three years before her. Uh, they also had to leave uh, public schools. It's very interesting since, I, again, I was studying to, for this talk and just in general about my parents' life. I'm a little embarrassed I didn't learn this earlier. You know, I waited till I'm in my 60s to even learn a lot of the details about their lives. It's like, well, why didn't I do this when I was younger? But um, I don't know. I didn't. And uh, it's interesting the parallels, though, between my, my mother and my father, because uh, my mother also was teased at school and, um, and, and ridiculed and called names. And so she had to leave. She and her brother had to leave uh, the public school. She went to school in the basement of a synagogue. And then uh, after a while, she couldn't go there either. So she didn't actually go to any school until she came to the United States. So, um, I'll get to this later, but she was 17 years old, sitting, I think, in a sixth grade class um, in the United States when she got here trying to catch up. In 1936, uh, my family fled, to, or my mother's family fled to uh, Italy. Uh, they left their, uh, she left her brother and her grandmother behind. Her brother escaped uh, eventually to England with the uh, Kinder Transport, uh, a number of uh, kids, uh, hundreds of children, got to um, to England via the Kinder Transport, and um, he joined the British Army. At the point, he changed his name to William Lincoln, and he kept that name, uh, but he had changed it in the British Army just to, for his protection in case he was captured by the Germans. And um, my grandmother was was killed in a concentration camp. She didn't make it out. This is my uh, mother. Obviously, a little bit younger, and my grandmother. And pardon the little marks; it's just it's just the old picture. But uh, that's my uh, my uncle. Uh, my uncle died also. My uncle did continue to live in England. He he died a number of years ago. And then this is again another picture of uh, my grandmother, and that's my grandfather, Kurt. So. When they moved to Italy, they moved to Genoa. So just again, to kind of give you an idea of where, you know, how far they actually went to, uh, to get uh, to Italy at that point. Um, they, got, they went to Germany because uh, Jews in Germany, whether you were in Königsberg or in Zeheim, could not own businesses, uh, even pharmacies. They actually lost their property. The, the government uh, seized their property. Um, my grandfather bought a bakery in Genoa. Um, it turns out that they um, got cheated because the, the bakery had massive debts and they couldn't get flour and other supplies uh, from their vendors because they wouldn't, because of the debts that they already owed. So they had to struggle to pay off the debts and, and make money. And so they worked day and night to try and make the business profitable. In the meantime, they put my mom in a child's home. Here she was um, in a strange country, in a, a language she didn't understand, and she was in a children's home. And then she finally did come home for a while, but uh, my parents were still not able to spend up a lot of, of time with her. Uh, and then uh, when she was 12, her mother got sick and was sick for about six months before, until she died. Uh, I've been to her grave in, in Genoa. And uh, so then it's her and her father, and uh, things were getting worse in Italy. So uh, both of her uncles, her father and mother's, her father's and mother's brothers, and her maternal grandparents had made it to the U.S. and were desperately trying to get mom and and uh, and grandfather to the U.S. 
but again, quota numbers were high, immigration stalled. Um, another, you know, this was just a, a really difficult time to even get out of Germany. So even if you wanted to. So it's not that they were, weren't trying to get out of the country. Uh, they, um, they were having a difficult time doing it. So let me play another little clip from uh, my mother. You can hear her story out of her mouth. It's better than me telling it. Germans were urging the Italians to get rid of the Jews. So there would be raids, like they would just pick up whoever they could catch. Um, and one day I came home from school um, and some friends intercepted me and said, um, your father is in prison and you have to bring him his overnight things. And um, so I picked up his overnight things and I, I took the trolley and I went to the prison all by myself and um, and um, the, the guards uh, met me and, and uh, I told them I was bringing these things for my father and uh, I and they went through the things that I had put into this little suitcase and they pulled out his razor and a pair of scissors and you know anything that was sharp and uh, said he can't have this and um, I left and uh, I didn't realize until later how dangerous it was for me to even go to the prison. I mean, mm -hmm. they could have just could put have me in there, too. too. And um, anyway, they, they kept my father and a lot of other people they had caught that, that day. Um, they kept him there a couple of days, and, and I was all by myself. And uh, when they let him out, uh, they told him that he had to leave the country within, I think it was two weeks or something, a very short period of time. Um, and there was no place to go. So uh, uh, friends of my parents, some friends, some people went and they just went into hiding. But, and they told my father to just go into hiding and, but he wouldn't do that. He, he just, he just couldn't do that. Yeah. So, uh, the way a lot of people did is they could get to France illegally. Uh, there were like fishermen that would take uh, people at night and get them from Italy over to France. Um, they would be paid a certain amount of money to do that. And then when people got to France, uh, they um, would have to pay a, a, a certain fine to get to into the, the French co government, um, and then the the um, uh, Jewish organizations would take over and take care of the people that had fled to um, France that way. So my father didn't want to take me on this very dangerous trip. So he left me with these friends of my parents, um, Dr. Kleiman and his wife, whose uh, quota number were pretty close 
to the quota number that we had for coming to the United States. And the, um, uh, the way they, my father figured and they agreed to take me with them to, to the United States and that my father would go to France by himself. So he wanted and to ensure he, he safe passage. Right. He wanted me to get out. So my um, father did get to France and uh, he lived a very uh, tense and uh, life uh, he was provided for by the highest in the Jewish organizations, but uh, we had tried to send him some of his clothes because the only thing that he was allowed to take when he fled was a knapsack on his back with a change of clothes, and that's all he had was a change of clothes and enough money to pay the French government whatever fine that had to be paid. And uh, so we managed to get some clothes to him, uh, but that's all he had. He had no way of earning any kind of money or anything. Unfortunately, in 1942, he, uh, he was taken uh, by the Germans, and uh, I still have his postcard. where he writes that he was going to leave on a train the next day. And that was the last we ever heard of him. Years later, through the Red Cross, The only thing that we were able to find out is that he was put on, on that transport, but he never even made it to camp. So unfortunately, that was the story of a lot of uh, Jews that time. So my mother uh, ended up with the Kleinmans and um, ended up going from Genoa to uh, Potenza. This is uh, identification she had to carry with her um, in Italy. They had to, the Italians um, were actually relatively civil to, uh, to the Jews in, in Italy, uh, although um, there was a lot of pressure from the Germans and they still had to like check in every day. Um, the, the Italians put them up in small villages throughout Italy. My mother uh, was in this uh, village in, uh, Paten uh, in Potenza uh, in southern Italy. Um, and she was in the care of the Kleinmans. Um, she was supposed to be uh, with them for just a few weeks and come over to the United States. But then four days before they were going to leave, um, war was de officially declared and uh, the, the harbor was closed and so they had to um, make do in, in Italy and it turned out to be four years before uh, she actually left. Uh, she had a lot of difficulties uh, living in Italy. Of course she was there uh, without her parents, living with the Kleinmans. Uh, they're trying to make a living. My mother talks about, and, and my father, that um, you know they were young, they were kids. They didn't really understand what was going on the way that uh, 
uh, that an adult would at that time. The Kleinmans were just trying to, uh, to make a living and they had this uh, woman, who, this child who was, they were in charge of. Um, so it was, uh, my mother tells lots of stories. I'm not gonna go into them now. They're really uh, interesting about living in a small town in, in Southern Italy during that time frame. Um, one of the more interesting things I think is that if you, again, think about what was going on at that time, uh, all the towns kind of had a main road going through them, and, um, and that was about it as far as uh, access to the town. So when the Germans and, uh, and troops in general would, uh, uh, would go through the towns, they would go, you know, go up Italy, they'd go through those, those main streets. So when the um, allies came in and, and, and uh, fought the, uh, the Germans, they, um, the fighting was like right in the middle of, of the village where they, they were living. A woman, Elizabeth Bettina, wrote a book. Um, this is just a few years ago. She lives in New York and she's Catholic. Uh, but uh, she wrote a book called It Happened in Italy. Um, and she took the trouble to um, actually research uh, how the Italians treated the Jews during World War II. And uh, because it's really a story that hasn't been told. So, or hadn't been told very well. Um, there obviously was um, people who died and ended up in camps uh, like my grandfather, but uh, the Italians on the whole were a lot more protective of the, uh, the Jews who lived in the, in the villages in Italy than, than other parts of Europe. So, um, so the Allies freed southern Italy. Um, at that point, the, uh, the Kleinmans and, and my mother were, were actually thinking that they were going to go to Israel. But then an opportunity came up for uh, going to the United States. And there's another book that uh, actually tells uh, my mother's story. It's called Haven. They've actually um, produced a couple of movies, uh, also called Haven. Um, Haven or, or Haven, Safe Haven, I think is the name of the, uh, one of the movies. And um, what happened is this, this woman, Ruth Gruber, who's still alive, she's 101 years old, I think now, um, and she uh, w worked in the State Department at the time, and she was able to get uh, the State Department to authorize uh, the U.S. Uh, Gibbons, uh, which was bringing troops, uh, injured troops back from uh, Italy to accommodate a thousand refugees. So Kleinman's applied for um, uh, Dr. and Mrs. Kleinman and for my mother, and they were turned down. They had like over 3,000 applications for 1,000 spots. And, uh, and then the Kleinman's applied, separately from, uh, applied for my mother separately, and she was accepted onto the ship. So uh, she was, uh, so that's how she got to the United States, on a, on a ship that was uh, authorized by Roosevelt. This was after Southern Italy had been liberated by the uh, Americans. Um, the war was still on and Northern Italy was still, uh, there was still fighting going on, but um, she was able to get on this uh, ship. And, the, um, and this book uh, talks all about uh, the, the, how that ship was authorized and, and my mother's pictures in it, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, that's uh, my mother right there with uh, the kindergarten kids. Uh, this was actually, I think, when they got after they got off the ship in, in New York. But uh, there are, uh, there's a number of pictures in there of, of the ship and um, and the, the refugees uh, on the ship. So my mother was 17 at this point. Uh, she um, got to the camp, and this was a, a fort, Fort Ontario in Oswego, New York. It's uh, one of the and, and so they just used the fort to intern the, uh, the refugees. They were not officially in the United States. They were like officially guests of the United States. And so it really freaked my mother out that she goes from Italy, uh, where at least they were free to walk around the town, to supposedly this free country, the United States, and she's behind barbed wire. And they weren't allowed to, uh, to go out. Uh, it, it wasn't like they were, you know, held in at gunpoint, but, uh, but she, um, 
she would go out sometimes, like for she was learning, uh, like she, I mentioned earlier, she went to school. So she was, I think, uh, taking like fourth grade classes and she's 17 uh, or sixth grade classes in order to, uh, to catch up and, and learn English and, and catch up with uh, studies. And she eventually learned to, uh, to be a nurse and she was certified as a nurse. And uh, then she met my dad in Rochester. And uh, my dad was uh, like the president of a, a club for um, German Jewish refugees, a, a Jewish uh, organization that they had in New York. And it's a, it's a fun story about uh, my dad uh, meeting my mom because she was shy and he was pretty assertive and she stood him up and, you know, but eventually, obviously, they ended up together and, um, and and then, and then I happened about uh, 11 months after they got married. So that's my mother. <laughs> now me. Um, I didn't think I would need to put a picture in there since I'm standing here, but I was born in Rochester. Um, moved to uh, Nashville, Tennessee when I was uh, almost six years old because it was with my father's job. He uh, worked for Transcript Corporation and moved, they, moved the, they moved the printing press from, uh, from Rochester to Nashville. And um, there's a very small Jewish community in Nashville. Um, it's actually a little larger now than it was when I, I was young. It's grown, but uh, there were uh, a couple synagogues and lots of stories about, uh, I mean, it was just interesting growing up in a southeastern, in the southeastern United States uh, as a Jew um, when there weren't a lot of other Jewish people there. I, was, I think in my high school there were like three Jewish people. Um, so um, I was very conscious of my, my Jewishness when I was young. Uh, this is a uh, <laughs> picture of, uh, kind of funny picture of uh, me and my uh, two sisters and my little brother Ken. Like I said, he's 12 years younger than I am, so uh, it really shows there. And uh, this is in our living room in, the, in, in Nashville. Um, so people have asked me, you know, what are the effects the fact that my parents are survivors, what, what were the effects on me? And I'm not really sure. I mean, I don't have anything to compare it to. I do know that, um, that I am small. I was never very athletic. Uh, I was pretty smart, but, uh, I, did, um, but I didn't have a lot of really close friends. My, my, both my parents have you know, German accents, and I didn't even realize my parents had German accents, by the way, until I was in high school. Someone mentioned my father's accent, and I said, what accent? Like, <laughs> so, uh, it's bizarre. And I had ambivalent feelings about being Jewish and about Germany. Uh, on my next slide, I'll talk about my business to Germany. I, I didn't want to go to Germany. I thought, God, you know, why would I want to go there? And um, um, I wanted to fit in, like I guess every kid does, but it was, uh, it was, it was, it was a little difficult growing up in that kind of environment. Um, this was, uh, so I was born in 51, so we're talking about uh, early, you know, the late 50s and, and early 60s, so those were kind of turbulent times anyway for uh, socially. And um, my parents had friends, there were, it just so happens there was a small community in Nashville of uh, other refugees, and so they had some close friends. Uh, in Nashville, to this day, although a lot of them, have, most of them have died, um, who are uh, refugees from uh, from different parts of Europe from the Holocaust. Uh, but uh, Dad worked uh, as a printer. He worked uh, managing um, a cloth factory and then the IRS. But he, he he didn't have a professional job, so he you know he had to work long hours. He's raising a family with four kids. Um, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, and my, you know, my, my dad wasn't real wealthy money-wise, but when he died, the, the synagogue was full of, of, of people. Uh, when we went through the, 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 the funeral service, it was, um, my dad was very rich in, in friends and, and um, he was rich where it counted. And, um, but he told me a couple times, you know, that they felt uncomfortable being parents. They didn't, since their parents had died when they were young, they had no model really for what it was like to, to be a parent. Um, I, 
I identify really strongly with Judaism, I think because of their, their past and, and what we've gone through and my dad still being, you know, going to synagogue and being, I hated going to synagogue, like, oh, I don't recall, <laughs> when I was a kid. Uh, I still really don't go that much, but, but it means a lot to me. I mean, it's, I identify strongly with more probably with the Jewish tradition and, and, and culture and attitude toward life than, than the, the, the praying and, 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 and going to synagogue. But um, and the, the values, Jewish values, I think, are what's, what's most important to me. And I, and I learned that from, from my parents. And, um, and so I think that's, that's a good thing. Um, I did study psychology in, in, in college, and it's funny because I was just talking to um, um, someone here. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Bob. Bob? Yeah, I was just talking to Bob earlier, and he's, he's a, a professor in, in psychology, or in sociology, and it made me remember, I just added this bullet earlier because it made me think of it. I think that's one of the reasons I, I uh, majored in psychology in, in, in college, because of uh, trying to just understand people, understand how this could all happen. And um, there's one study in particular um, by Stanley Milgram, which anyone who studies psychology probably knows that study, but it was a, a study on obedience. And, um, and Milgram was actually uh, a survivor, and um, he, uh, he wanted to understand why Germans would obey to the extent that they would uh, just murder people in, in cold blood the way they did. And he started a study at Yale in, in the United States, and he never even got to Germany because he discovered that um, Americans are just, everybody has this, uh, the 60%, well, I won't describe the whole study, but he discovered that over 60% of the people would, uh, would obey orders, so to speak, uh, to the extent that they would injure people. And uh, in the U.S., you didn't even have to go to Germany. So it just really made me realize that it could happen here. It could happen anywhere. It's really important to hear these stories and to understand because it could happen anywhere. We have to always be on guard about it. it you know, if you look at the evolution of how things got to be the way they did in Germany, it didn't just happen overnight. It was a process that happened over a while, and people got to a point because of depression, uh, uh, economic depression, um, that they became so desperate and so fearful that um, that they would uh, would kind of grasp at straws, and it's uh, it's important. So so I've I've become a lot more sensitive to to uh, this whole immigration thing, which is uh, obviously in the news a lot these days. That because uh, my parents were immigrants and refugees, a lot of my relatives could have been saved and weren't because of the immigration policy of the United States. Um, I did first visit Germany back in 95. I was scared to go. I was, and um, uh, I was pleasantly surprised. There were the German people uh, on the whole are just incredibly, uh, well, they go out of their way to help. It's, it's just, I, I've just been um, uh, really impressed. Uh, there was this one book, uh, it's called, it's in German, Juden in, Juden in Zeheim and Jugendheim. The town where my dad grew up is actually now the two towns combined, so it's actually called Zeheim Jugendheim. But it's, uh, but this guy, Robert Birch, again, who's not Jewish, wrote a book of, uh, he went back and researched all the Jews who lived in these two towns and wrote a book about it. And my, that's where I got that picture of my father, as a matter of fact, uh, in, in the school. So, um, so there's a lot of people who, in Germany, who, uh, Robert died um, a, a while back, but I know his, his, his two sons, Eberhard and, and Georg, and we still talk when I, when I visit Germany. And uh, there's a lot of people who, in Germany, who are really um, aware of what happened. I mean, they're not personally responsible. They, did, they weren't there during the, the war, but they took responsibility for what happened, and they've done a lot to, um, that's the thing that impressed me the most. They've done a lot to, uh, to show that they're responsible and to do constructive, uh, visible things that will keep it from happening again. And um, the most significant um, probably was the, the Stolperstein uh, dedication that I went to in 2013. I was invited, actually my father was invited, but he was 
uh, wasn't well enough to travel uh, a couple years ago to, this was just uh, less than four, well, yeah, four years ago almost exactly, uh, that I went to, um, to Germany for uh, this little invitation or a welcome card when, when we got to Zeheim uh, just uh, in, in 2013. Uh, this is my father's house today uh, with Anne standing by it. But the, oh, but the important thing is if you see, it's, it's hard to see, but right here in front of the house are, are some stones, some little plaques that are put in the sidewalk. And these are called the Stolpersteine, and, um, which literally means stumbling block or stumbling stone. And there are literally thousands of them uh, around Germany. Uh, when we were in Berlin uh, last September, we were looking, we saw a lot of them. There's, there's over 5,000 of them just in Berlin. The, uh, an artist in Germany started this project, but uh, it's grown and the, um, these pla little plaques are put in the sidewalk throughout Germany and Poland and Romania. There's different places, also, different countries also. Uh, in front of the homes that where, where Jewish people lived before they uh, were forced out of their homes. Um, these are the five Stolpersteine that are in front of uh, my father's house. The one on the upper left is Hermann Rosenfeld, my grandfather, and Emilia Rosenfeld, my grandmother. Uh, and then there's Herbert Rosenfeld, my uncle, and Erich Rosenfeld, my father. And it says, uh, here uh, lived Eric Rosenfeld, uh, born 1925, fled uh, in 1941 to the USA. And then uh, Herbert uh, Simler fled in 1938. Herman uh, says that he uh, died uh, in 1938. And uh, my mother, my grandmother, that she was uh, killed in the concentration camp. She was deported in 1942. By the way, I don't think I made it clear. I forgot to, to mention it, a little, going back just a little bit. Um, when my father was um, taking the mayor out for a ride, and the mayor didn't think he was going to come back, apparently what happened that time in Germany was the, someone in the town, the mayor, someone would um, essentially round up all the Jews and bring them to the, uh, to the city square where the, where the military would, 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 would take them. and, and deport them to the, to the camps. But it was the responsibility of, of a local official to, um, to round up the people in the, in the town who were Jewish. So that's what kind of, that, that's so you can imagine a little bit more about my father's sense of the mayor. Well, you know, he might not have killed my grandmother directly, but he was the one who rounded them up in order for them to be sent to the camps. My, my uh, uncle, Max Meyer, um, he, uh, this is actually the most interesting one. Uh, we thought that he died in the concentration camp uh, until uh, the Stolpersteiner project. It's, it's really amazing what uh, this town did. Zeheim, um, uh, Klaus Knacha, who's a superintendent of, of schools there, he kind of took charge of this project and there were high school students who researched my family and other families who were in Zeheim. And a high school, when we were there for this dedication for the Stoberstein, a high school girl got up and, um, and told the story of my grandmother. And uh, she was in tears when she was telling the story. It was uh, very moving and uh, it's just remarkable that, uh, that's what really impressed me is that they're really taking what happened to heart and um, and taking personal ownership of, of what they're not personally responsible. You know, this happened to their ancestors, but they're, uh, they're taking personal responsibility for it. So in the process of doing this research, um, and they found out that, that Max uh, was blind. He went blind, uh, apparently uh, being a secretary and too much strain on his eyes. And um, so the Germans had this program they called T4, Oxion T4, where they took people from mental hospitals, anyone who was disabled in any way, uh, mentally disabled, blind, whatever, and they murdered them. And this was not even known, I mean, they, they, they hid it for a long time until it, it wasn't, uh, it, it didn't matter if they hid it, but uh, this was early on uh, in, in, in the late 30s when, uh, so actually 41, I guess, when he was, um, when he was, and 
And interestingly, at Air Mordet, Air Mordet, uh, 4 to April 2nd, 1941, murdered. So the other thing that impressed me is that they didn't mince words. You know, they didn't say, oh, he was killed or euthanized or, or put to death. He was, he was murdered. And so they didn't, they didn't use euphemisms. And, uh, and that's maybe a strange thing to talk about, but, but I was impressed by that. I, I thought that that was uh, taking responsibility for what really happened and, and calling you know, a, a spade a spade, saying what, uh, what was going on. And um, so I'm, I'm just very much impressed that they, that they did that. So um, there's a law in Germany uh, that's been around for a few years now that any people who are displaced, uh, deprived of their German citizenship, deprived of their citizenship between 1933 and 1945 is entitled to free citizenship, uh, free German citizenship. And so um, I'd known about it for a while. My daughter, it's not a great picture of her, but um, she wanted to, uh, to possibly work in, in Europe and with a, uh, with citizenship in any EU country, you can work in the EU. Um, and so, uh, so she wanted to take advantage of that. So at the same time she got her German citizenship, I got mine as well. And so, so I'm actually a German citizen and have a German passport, believe it or not. <laughs> Hard for me to believe it sometimes, but uh, um, so, uh, so I am a German citizen. So I have actually two passports, a German and a US passport. And, um, so this is my family as of a couple years ago, uh, 2014, uh, with uh, my father and mother, uh, Anna, myself, my sister Vera, my sister Emily. Uh, this is uh, Vera's husband, and this is my daughter Tamara, a little bit better picture of her, and uh, my brother Ken and his wife and their two boys. Uh, we're missing uh, Vera's two kids in this, um, actually, and uh, Emily's two kids as well. But this is uh, the, the, the family kind of as we are today. And I just wanted to end with um, when my father died, he, um, we started looking through his files. And I found something that I hadn't seen before. It's a letter he wrote to my children and grandchildren. And it goes on for a while, but I just wanted to share the last paragraph. I have tried to have a positive outlook so this is the last paragraph of, the, uh, of, of his, what he wrote to his children and grandchildren, which is why I thought I'd show this slide. Um, I have tried to have a positive outlook, looking for the best in people, and also trying to do the best for the ones close to me as well as others. I have tried not to forget what has happened, and by relating my experience to students, hope to exert what influence I could for them to be open-minded and to be critical and discerning of the media. I am thankful for having survived all of the difficult times I have experienced. It is hard for me to understand the discrimination, hatred, cruelty, and animosity which has been a part of history, and I can only hope for a better future. I am thankful for living in a free country. I am thankful that I can worship where I want without interference or coercion. I am proud of you and your love and your accomplishments. Dad. <laughs>